Before we get started, I want to offer special thanks to my colleague Katie Peck, who uh, uh, put the uh, event together. And I also want to uh, offer a special thanks to Ted Trimble from the National Cancer Institute, who brought this idea forward initially a number of weeks ago, uh, which we were uh, thrilled at the chance to pull this, uh, pull this event together. So thank you, Ted. And, um, and I also want to thank our speakers who are with us here today. Uh, Dr. Harold Varmus, the director of the National Cancer Institute, Nobel laureate, former head of National Institutes of Health, former president and CEO of Sloan Kettering. Thank you, Harold, for being with us. Ambassador Sally Cowell, uh, a good friend, a longstanding friend of, of mine and of CSIS, who is the head of senior vice president for global health at the American Cancer Society and has worked uh, at senior positions in a multitude of diplomatic and public health institutions over the years and is a, a remarkably accomplished leader, both as a diplomat and global, and global health expert. Sally, thank you for thank being you. with us today. Uh, Tom Boyke, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, also a longstanding friend uh, of CSIS, who just completed at the end of, of 2014 a groundbreaking task force on, on NCDs, on non-communicable diseases. <coughs> which we'll hear more about today. And Tom, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to take this conversation in a couple different ways. We're going to uh, open with one, one round of comments, introductory uh, remarks. We'll start uh, with Harold and Sally. Tom, to talk about uh, two things, really, in the opening segment. One is uh, the, the, how their respective institutions are looking at this whole question around global cancer. Uh, and, and, and what do we need to know about uh, the way they look at this and the things that have been undertaken in recent years in order to raise the profile and be more, more uh, uh, effective and impactful in this area. And then as part of that, to talk about the tools that exist today that are accessible and affordable and, and, and impactful that are ready-made, that perhaps if with a little bit more <coughs> energy and attention, could be, uh, could be brought forward in a more effective fashion. So we'll go through one round of conversations uh, uh, to open things up along those lines. Then we'll move into a second segment, which is thinking more long-term and more strategically around forging coalitions. Uh, how do you build a coalition long-term? How do you set a long-term research and development agenda? How do you begin campaigns that are priority campaigns? These sort of things, because across these institutions, all of those topics, the coalition building, the R&D agenda, the campaigns, are, are, are part of their everyday and long-term work. So thank you. Harold, why don't you kick things off for us? Thank you, Steve. And uh, I want to just begin by making uh, a brief remark about the, the historical significance of what we're doing here today on, on, on World Cancer Day. Uh, from the perspective of somebody who's getting long in the tooth and remembers a time when this would not have happened. So when I was a medical student in the 60s, uh, I was interested in global health, but I was interested in what we then called tropical disease, and that meant neglected tropical diseases, tuberculosis, other infectious diseases, uh, perinatal uh, deaths. Uh, and it wouldn't have occurred to any of us to think about cancer in that context. Um, and now, of course, the world is very different. Uh, people are living much longer lives in poor countries and, and lower middle income countries. Uh, they are more susceptible to non-communicable diseases. Uh, we've had appreciable gains in control of infectious disease, and uh, the focus has definitely shifted, as you'll hear. But even in the 60s, when I was um, more me mesmerized by infectious disease in poor countries and not thinking about chronic disease, even then, uh, the National Cancer Institute was already involved in studying cancer in poor countries, in particular in Uganda, where Dennis Burkett had discovered Burkitt's lymphoma, had displayed one of the first uh, 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 beneficial effects of chemotherapy by using cytoxan to dramatically improve the health of kids with this horrific disease, where they discovered um, Epstein-Barr virus, demonstrating that studying uh, cancers in, in poor countries can be beneficial to the rest of the world. So many principles were laid down then, and despite the political ebbs and flows in Uganda, the institute in, in Makarari, at Makarari University that was established 
in the 60s survived and to this day uh, does important work on a variety of especially virus-associated cancers that are abundant in Uganda. So many of the principles that underlie my own organization's uh, commitment to fostering um, better control of cancer in poor countries was laid down in those early days. When I came to the NCI about five years ago, um, it was immediately apparent from looking at, at our current portfolio that we have a lot of investments in uh, global health uh, in, in uh, various parts of the world, epidemiology, clinical trials, and other things, but that the effort was not well focused, not well organized, and we created a center for global health as headed by Ted Trimble, who apparently provided the, the, uh, the, the spark of the idea for this conversation. Uh, and what we tried to do is to uh, recognize, first of all, that we ought to have a template for thinking about controlling cancer in different countries, and that we need to be sensitive to the fact that, that of the almost 200 countries throughout the world, the capacities, the financial commitment, uh, the, the personnel, the nature of cancer in each country is very different. Cancer is not one disease. It's a multitude of diseases which differ in frequency every place we look. So our ma mantra in approaching uh, efforts to study cancer, which is what NIH does, is to do research, uh, and uh, um, has been to, to, to uh, list uh, with respect to every country what needs to be done. That begins with saying, what is the problem? Developing registries, uh, learning to identify epidemiological problems that need to be solved to understand the cause, the cause of developments in a certain cancer, uh, and leading uh, to the development of a national cancer plan in which a nation decides how much to commit to trying to control cancer in various ways based on what resources are available for doing it and what cancers are afflicting their population. So at that point, the national cancer plan needs to build heavily on uh, developing uh, an agenda of, uh, of cost-effective uh, uh, pursuits, those that basically pluck the low-hanging fruit. That often begins with a recognition that many cancers have an infectious origin, and for some of those, we have vaccines, like the human <clears throat> papillomavirus vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, uh, that many of the factors that predispose to cancer are um, also factors that predispose to other chronic diseases. Number one on that list by far is tobacco use, and I'm sure as everybody in this room knows, uh, tobacco use is out of control in, in many countries around the world. As people develop wealth, they often advertise that by taking up tobacco use, which can be expensive. Uh, and controlling tobacco, which, uh, which is used by as many as 50 to 60 percent of males in many countries around the world, uh, and an increasing number of women, is the number one um, factor in trying to control cancer in poor countries. Uh, the third set of factors have to do with, with behaviors like uh, overeating and getting exercise, and, and we try to contribute in planning to reduce cancer rates, which can be reduced, incidents can be reduced by as much as 50% in, in many countries. We then look at health systems and think, what can we do to improve screening for <coughs> catching cancers early, improving uh, hospital <coughs> resources so that uh, this myth that cancer is simply too difficult to treat, too expensive to to treat can be overcome. So things as simple as easy surgeries, um, uh, as I mentioned, screening, for, especially for uh, 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 colorectal, oropharyngeal, and a few other cancers, very important things to implement, not terribly expensive. And then there are drugs, and many drugs that are very effective for certain cancers uh, can, be, can be afforded. Uh, and the fourth element here is, uh, is uh, is controlling symptoms, what we call palliative care, which is especially important at the end of life. No one in the world should be dying of cancer in an excruciating fashion. Finally, um, in thinking about all this, we have to consider uh, how we mobilize resources, because we, you know, especially at this time in the history of NIH, we can't do everything ourselves. And we find that our cancer centers around the country, there are 68, are very responsive to the idea of helping with this global battle. And we provide supplementary funding in modest amounts that gets leveraged uh, to uh, make our cancer centers uh, paired with cancer centers in, in poor countries. Uh, we try to take advantage of the enthusiasm of 
young faculty and students, trainees, for this battle. Uh, and we try to convince uh, uh, people who make policy that there are advantages to doing uh, what uh, we're, we're, we're hoping will get done. Uh, to this end, I think it's very important to be setting goals, uh, to be thinking about uh, uh, d disease priorities as, uh, uh, and, and recognizing that there's a change in our, the approach to global health. And I hope that in today's discussion, we get into some of the ways in which we can not only make the decisions about what to pursue, but find the tools for doing that. <clears throat> Thank you, Harold. Sarah, Sally. Thank you. My name actually is Sarah, but um, so thank you. Um, and thanks for inviting me here today on, on World uh, Cancer Day. Um, the theme of this year's world, you know, these years all have themes. And the theme of this one is not beyond us. And I think that's actually a very good theme because it's, um, to me, it says that there are a number of immediately deployable tools. As Dr. Varmus has said, I could just say amen and, and quit here. But Don't. Um, <laughs> we know what to do. We have things at our fingertips that we could deploy that don't cost very much money that would make a significant and almost immediate difference in the global cancer burden. So um, I stand up and cheer when I hear it's not beyond us. This is... Uh, a slogan we heard in a different form in 2008 when somebody said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can do something about cancer. And so um, in this first part, I think that what Steve wanted us to talk about was some of the best buys. And then um, I think Dr. Varmus has already mentioned um, most of them that we at the American Cancer Society are also working on. Um, we are in some ways the civil society equivalent to the National Cancer Institute, and we work very closely um, with the National Cancer Institute, with its global um, center, also with the World Health Organization and its regional affiliates, such as uh, PAHO in, in this region of the world, um, because we won't do this alone. This needs to be an all-of-society approach and an all-of-government approach if we're going to make any kind of a difference. Um, what we're trying to do globally is an extension of what the American Cancer Society does domestically. We're driven by our, our domestic mission, which is really to, to, we're committed to preventing cancer, to saving lives, to diminishing suffering, and to mobilizing a global network. Um, here in the United States, we have about four million volunteers who work in virtually every community in the United States to promote survivorship to um, promote early detection, to promote prevention. Um, and we want to extend what we do in the United States to vulnerable communities abroad. We know how to save lives, and we know what works. So we just have to apply what we already know. And we feel at the American C Cancer Society that it's beyond that. It's also our moral obligation to do so because it is not only the fact that people are living long enough to, to become burdened with these non-communicable diseases, and that's a triumph to a certain extent of public health, that we now use, lose fewer people to childhood diseases and fewer people to HIV and AIDS, so that they live longer and they live long enough um, to become burdened with things like cancer. But it's not that benign. Um, the moral obligation is that we are also exporting our Western lifestyle, whether that's tobacco or um, diet or physical inactivity. So since we have exported that lifestyle, it's about time we exported our knowledge about cancer control, too. And we have some good lessons. Um, the United States, which has 11% of the world's cancer incidence, has about 50% of the world's cancer survivors. So we have learned certain things, and all of them may not be applicable everywhere, and that's why we try to focus on countries where we think we can make the most difference because the policy environment is conducive. There may be a national cancer plan. Um, it may be a democracy where we can help build these civil society forces that urge their governments to do more about communicable diseases. And it's also on certain kinds of cancers, cancers where there are um, very good ways to prevent them, um, such as tobacco, the, uh, not using tobacco, um, or where there are very good 
ineffective, effective and inexpensive ways to screen and treat for those cancers, such as, as cervical cancer. So we're focused um, right now on trying to make a difference in a number of countries. Um, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia are big focus uh, countries for us. Um, this year, also India, because of the burden of disease in India. And we're focused on, on cancers like um, cervical cancer. Um, and also, as Dr. Varmus mentioned, uh, the notion of palliative care. Uh, the fact that 85% of all pain medications in the world are used by just 7% of the world's population is a huge um, equity gap which we know we have the tools and we've already uh, been able to roll out those tools to a number of countries and we've seen that within a period of two or three years, a difference can be made. So um, that's what we're focusing on um, right now, tobacco, uh, women's cancer, cervical cancer, but also not ignoring breast cancer, recognizing that um, breast cancer is um, at a very early age, and we had a, a very good forum uh, yesterday at the Pan American Health Organization on breast cancer in low and middle income countries. Uh, so breast cancer, and it's an interesting curve as countries become richer, breast cancer incidence goes up and cervical cancer incidence tends to go down. So we can't bury our head in the sands and forget that breast cancer isn't rising also very quickly. So uh, I'll stop there, and um, we'll come back on a second round to talk Great. about some other things. Thank you. Tom, Great. tell us a bit about your work. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here on World Cancer Day. It's uh, always nice to be at CSIS and uh, work with Steve, so I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity. And it's a pleasure to be on the stage with, uh, with Sally and Harold. Uh, I'll start with my remarks just telling you about a task force. We recently pulled together a group of um, experts uh, across uh, a variety of fields, um, global health, trade, development, national security, uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, task forces are a signature initiative that the Council does. They're typically led by former presidents or secretaries of states or individuals of uh, that stature. This is our first devoted to global health. And I point that out to uh, tell you how the seriousness with which we view non-communicable diseases and what's happening in uh, low and middle income countries. The way we were able to pull together a group like this, and it's not, uh, it's leading people in global health, but not people who had spoken out about NCDs before, people like, uh, or at least not in low and middle income countries or were known for doing so. Um, former uh, uh, health secretaries and heads of CDC and surgeon generals, those types of individuals. And we, we were able to pull them together by uh, telling them they could say no to the question that we had to ask, which is, are non-communicable diseases, such as cancer, a problem in low and middle income countries? Uh, is this an area in which, if it is a problem, is an area which, in which the U.S. has a national interest? There are lots of global problems. They're not all the U.S.'s job to solve. Uh, if it is an area in which the U.S. has a national interest, what, what could be done about it, uh, both in the short term and in the longer term? And the way we approach this is we it took a very data-driven um, uh, take on this. Uh, Chris Murray, who, as many of you may know, leads the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, was kind enough to uh, beyond the task force, and we worked extensively with them in looking at what, what does this look like in low and middle income countries. And what we found are non-communicable diseases like cancer are increasing faster, younger, and having much worse outcomes than in high income settings. Uh, just to throw some numbers behind that, uh, the rate of uh, deaths from non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries has increased 53% since 1990. That's significantly faster than the rate of population growth. If you look at particular cancers, uh, the burden from breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa in most countries has increased over 100% since 1990. Uh, if you look at lung cancer, depending on the country, it's 50 to 70% since 1990. So very, very fast. Uh, it's not just a fast increase, it's a rising in very young populations. 
80% of or more of the burden of non-communicable diseases in sub-Saharan African countries and South Asia is happening in populations under 60. So we took a stricter definition of prematurity than the WHO uses because it thought we'd get the point across to people what this looks like. And we looked at populations 59 or younger. And what we found, again, 80% of the burden. That's 8 million uh, deaths, 59 and younger from non-communicable diseases in 2013 alone, to give you a sense. Uh, because these diseases are largely chronic, uh, and people are sick longer, and they're sick younger, and they have worse outcomes, has enormous economic impact. World Economic Forum has estimated it will, non-communicable diseases will extract $21 trillion in economic costs by 2030. That's roughly the economic output of all low- and middle-income countries in a single year. Uh, the other thing we identify in this group is that this isn't being driven by byproducts of success. I think most people are not merely. Most people assume this is driven by our success in cutting infectious diseases, uh, incomes are rising in low and middle income countries, people are adopting perhaps unhealthy uh, lifestyles. And what we found is in low income countries, the rate of increase of non-communicable diseases is 300% faster than the rate of decline in infectious diseases. In lower middle income countries, it's a third faster. Uh, rates of uh, obesity, physical inactivity in low and, low and lower middle income countries are still really low. What's driving it? Same thing that is driving other global health problems. Poverty, lack of health spending, uh, dramatic, uh, a dramatic expansion of urbanization depending on which uh, cancers you're talking about or which health conditions you're talking about. These are, these are the, uh, the um, uh, drivers uh, in these settings more than uh, just simply a byproduct of success. So why, why should the U.S. care? This, this is bad. Um, I, I love the, uh, the um, slogan, not beyond us, because I think you can read it two ways. It's not beyond us just in terms of its solutions, but it's also not beyond us as a global health problem. It's, it's here now. Um, but why is, it, uh, why is it the U.S.'s problem to solve? And I think most people, probably nobody in this room, but most people assume what most of what we do in global health is about protecting U.S. citizens from direct health threats. And the vast majority of what we invest in in global health is not about uh, preventing a disease, an emerging infectious disease from coming here. It's about HIV or poor uh, maternal, newborn, and child health. It's uh, about malaria and the prevalence of these conditions in Malawi have nothing to do with the prevalence of these conditions in the United States. Uh, what we did is we looked at the 49 countries where the U.S. spends $5 million or more uh, annually in global health aid and asked what, what are people getting sick from prematurely and what are they dying from. And what we found is non-communicable diseases represent premature mortality, just premature mortality, 59 or younger, three and a half times the rate of premature deaths than HIV in the same countries the U.S. is invested in. They represent almost twice as many deaths as HIV, malaria, and TB combined in the same countries we invest in. So if we're invested, we invest in these countries because we care about the welfare of these governments, these countries, these people, the same reasons exist to invest in cancer uh, pre prevention and treatment in low and middle income countries. Which brings us to the last area. So this is the problem. It's a problem the U.S. should care about. What, what can we do about it? And some here I, I will, of course, echo um, some of the areas that uh, Harold and Sally rightly identified. Um, we, we looked at three buckets. The first are things that are shovel-ready now. And on the cancer side, tobacco control. Tobacco works in poor countries. It works in wealthy countries. Um, it's uh, cost-effective in many cases. It's revenue-generating but it is not an area in which we have invested sufficiently, both in the U.S. government as well as internationally. It's an area that deserves much more investment. Lung cancer is the leading uh, cause of death from cancer in low- and middle-income countries. 70% of lung cancer is driven by tobacco use. Um, we can do more. Uh, we talked about some of the vaccinations, prevention, HPV, hepatitis B, these all fall in categories of tools we have now. You, you can extend them to low and middle income countries without adoption. The second category is talking about some of the areas that both Harold and Sally mentioned is 
we've made enormous progress cutting premature mortality from a variety of cancer, particularly breast cancer. Drop, uh, uh, premature mortality has dropped a third, I think, since 1990. Um, or death rates, rather, has uh, dropped a third since 1990 from breast cancer in uh, the United States. Other high-income countries have had that success as well, whether you're talking about stomach cancer, testicular cancer, childhood cancers. We've made an enormous amount of progress, but these have, by and large, not been extended to low- and middle-income countries. And with a bit of investment on some of these diagnostic tools and uh, treatment measures, perhaps they could be. But it's an area where uh, NCI is doing good work now, but we need, we need a lot more investment uh, than there is currently. And the last area that we talked about are areas where the U.S. and low- and middle-income countries can learn a lot from one another. Uh, the U.S., as was pointed out, is an early adopter of the NCD problem. Um, and uh, certainly, we have a lot to learn on uh, cost-effective chronic care and other measures. And that's uh, what this task force uh, came up with around cancer in low middle income countries. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do think it would be useful to delve a little bit more into the whole question of why is it so difficult to make the case. Um, with respect to cancer. Um, we've had the presidential strategy and study. We've had uh, many other things like that we've heard about here. Uh, we've heard Tom talk about the nature of the threat, how the threat is conveyed and understood. There's certain mythology around too expensive or too difficult. There's the complexity of the field. There's multitude of different diseases or interventions that we're talking about. But I, it would be useful to hear you say a little bit more about your reflections on why it's difficult and what does that imply in terms of forward-leaning strategies looking ahead. Harold? Well, I think that some parts of it are difficult, other parts are not. I do think that the U.S. public is, is prepared to support these efforts. Uh, some years ago, uh, uh, I wrote a report with Tom Pickering for uh, the Institute of Medicine right. on this topic and uh, the, the U.S. investment in global health. What does it mean? Why, why should we do it? And part of the argument is that we are pretty good humanitarians on whole. I mean, there, there are <coughs> exceptions to that, but, but on the whole, we're, we do a pretty good job in responding to, to need. Um, and I agree with Tom. Not, this is not just about uh, uh, defending our country from, from threats of infectious disease or, or uh, uh, preparing to being concerned about sending our workers to third world countries where we, where we have investments, uh, that if we, we do care, um, just from a humanitarian perspective, that countries be healthier than they are. And we, and we, you know, we also recognize the, the other element here, which is that uh, the, the world in general is more secure if people are not being battered by diseases, that, especially diseases that, uh, that, that uh, occur at a fairly early age in life. Uh, and I actually applaud the idea of the council taking 60 as a year to emphasize uh, the, uh, the uh, life expectancy. WHOs tend to favor 70, but this idea of you know, everyone dies, and if you don't if you don't frame the question uh, in a way that avoids uh, the fact that that that, that eventually everybody dies of something, uh, you make a much better case for for, for advancing our cause here. Um, but I think that the problem is that. Uh, Cancer is, is enormously difficult to think about. Lots of different cancers, different causes, different ways to approach control. And what I think we've tried to do, and I think the, the, the council's report does the same thing, is to focus on some areas where things are now achievable. And I'm, I'm just reiterating what everyone said by pointing out that the tobacco control is way up among them. And dealing with vaccination becomes a little more complicated because the cost of papillomavirus vaccine uh, uh, by the, the, the unwillingness of countries to, uh, to make the investments in, in certain vaccine programs, but those are very effective too. They just don't have immediate consequences. Uh, so I think one of the, the, one of the things I hope comes across from today's discussion here and many other places is that there is a list of, um, of things that are currently ready to be used, are not all that expensive, uh, not all that difficult and can make a, a large impact. The final point I'd make uh, is that, um, that it's, it's important that the, 
that we recognize that, that uh, every country is different and the countries have to do this job in large part on their own. That we need to bring the expertise, guidance, uh, and, uh, and encourage each of these countries to develop their own program, use their own citizens and their own resources ultimately to get some measure of control of cancer in their countries because it, we're just not in a position at this point to bring in the arms that are required to prevent and treat cancers in a way that is appropriate to all those countries. Some of this really involves countries, partner countries, making this a top priority in their dialogue with us bilaterally, right? Some of this is the demand side of yeah. this. Some of it is also getting the private sector engaged because the private sector is so vitally important in all of this. Sally? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually fairly encouraged that we may be approaching a tipping point. I hope we're approaching a tipping point in which um, cancer and other uh, non-communicable diseases take their rightful place in terms of the world's attention. And, it, and I'm talking about low and middle mm -hmm. income countries in those countries and in the rest of the world, because as we've heard from Tom and others and the Institute of, of uh, IMHE and, and University of Washington demonstrated um, conclusively um, a couple of years ago that the greatest burden of disease in virtually every low and middle income country now they are not communicable diseases, they are cancer. And yet our funding, I think both our funding as the United States and our funding in, in multilateral institutions has not shifted along with that shifting burden of disease. We are a very generous country, as, as you point out, Harold. Um, we are a very humanitarian country. We do invest with the largest single funder of global health at about $9 billion, and that's not the money that's by and large going to the National Cancer Institutes or the things oh, that we do no, at that's home. That's PEPFAR. <laughs> um, but that's essentially PEPFAR, and yeah. there you have it. Yeah. Um, and of course, having been one of the founders of UNAIDS, working with Peter Piot mm -hmm. and others, I guess maybe we're the victims of our own success. We got it shifted that way because it was a tremendous crisis, and we were we were able, but I shouldn't say we were able, I should say that sort of by mobilizing the grassroots, both in developed countries and developing countries, we were able to escalate this problem to the point where it got the attention of the funders around the world and the policy makers around the world. Mm -hmm. What I'm encouraged about is that an organization like the Council on Foreign Relations would devote its first um, task force on a health issue to non-communicable diseases. I see that as the beginning of a shift. I think it's also necessary that we shift at the top and at the same time things come up from underneath. That's why we're trying to, in the American Cancer Society, mobilize our four million volunteers and others um, to be doing more in their own communities to see that you know, the world cannot forever exist um, in, in a place where we are, are the only island of hope surrounded by a sea of despair. Um, we, we need to invest in others. We need to tell our congressmen that perhaps of our $9 billion in allocation for global health, uh, it's no longer appropriate that 85% of that, 90% of that, 95% of that should go to infectious diseases and maternal health when really the biggest burden of disease is elsewhere. So I think we need to, I would of course like to see more funding for global health because I think it's important to our stability and security as a world as well as our own economic progress. Um, you mentioned the private sector. The private sector of course is counting on its growth and development being the, the growth of healthy, uh, economically active populations in low and middle income countries. If they're um, devastated by non-communicable diseases, dying at an earlier age, not productive members of their own societies and not consumers for our product, then that promise will not be there. So in that sense, I think non-communicable diseases are every bit as devastating to um, the world and to us as communicable diseases. That distinction is really a, a distinction without a difference, I think. They are undermining the fabric of society in these countries. When women are dying of cervical cancer at age 30 and 40 and 50, first of all, we may have already invested in them because we are trying to save them from 
um, getting HIV or dying from AIDS because we've made medicines available so they don't die of AIDS. Do we want to lose these same women to cervical cancer for not investing any resources in that? Um, they're still a loss to the productive workforce of their countries, and they're still a, a loss in terms of being um, consumers for our products. So I think um, the, the case is certainly there. We're trying to, we've made it, I think, or are making it at the top level. Um, through our volunteer efforts and others, there's a wonderful survey also just released um, by a, an NGO called Arogia World, and it's a survey of 10,000 women and the effect of NCDs on them. And they're women from, in countries from Afghanistan to the United States. And each one of them talks about um, what has happened because of non-communicable diseases in her own life, that she's caring for um, parents, she's caring for a husband, she's running a household. Up to 25% of her household income is now going toward the care of either herself with a chronic disease or family members with a chronic disease. So um, the investments that we have made, we shouldn't put at risk by now not reaching out and making this next investment. It does sometimes, I must say, shock me when I see how interested uh, the Congress can get in Ebola. Uh, I know Steve's just come back from an Ebola trip, and I'm aware of the fact that it's, a, a, it's an important emerging issue. But the number of people who have um, died from cancer just in the few months that we have been talking about the Ebola outbreak is, is far, far um, more devastating to those societies. So I agree there probably won't be um, a global fund for cancer, although some people are beginning to talk about it. But I think through empowering civil societies in countries themselves, to um, ask their own governments to step up to the plate and do more and invest more. And by generous countries like the United States investing in these things, we will begin to make a difference. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit more about strategy. I would like Tom to talk a bit about tobacco and about the framework convention and trade issues. And you know, this is, the convention's been around for a decade. Uh, the progress has flattened significantly. As you've all indicated, this is a top-line priority in an area where you have, a, you have a consensus around a convention, but you've got a sort of static situation. How do we get out of that strategically? How do you, how do you imagine in the next several years getting to a better place than in five years saying, well, we're, we're still stuck? Great. Um, I'm going to answer that question, but I want to put some numbers behind what Sally just said about the disparity of funding is it's one issue we looked at in the task force. And we looked at what does the US spend per disability adjusted life year lost uh, to various causes in low and middle income countries. And what that works out to is for HIV, we spend $47 per dally. Uh, for malaria, we spend $5 per dally. For tuberculosis, we spend $1.80 per dally. For poor maternal, newborn, and child health, we spend $1.50 per dally, and for NCDs, we spend two cents. Uh, we did a fairly thorough assessment of U.S. global health spending, and $10 million out of our uh, uh, budget of $8.4 billion goes to non-communicable diseases. Uh, that's very low. Uh, I think this is in part happens because people have looked at this issue globally. You think you, we think we understand cancer in low and middle income countries because we know people who have cancer here, uh, your, your spouse, your, your parent, your grandparent. And I think one of the problems with looking at this issue globally is we fail to recognize the, what's happening in low and middle income countries, and that's part of the reason why we focused on them. I think part of HIV is idiosyncratic in a whole variety of ways in terms of why it launched. But one thing that was very effective about that was the recognition that we had, we were productively addressing a problem here, but other countries were not able to do so, and we could do something about it. And I think the same is true on tobacco, and I think it's true on cancer issues. People, we've made enormous progress here. Uh, tobacco um, uh, use prevalence has dropped from 42% in 1960 to 18% now. In the U.S., it has been uh, uh, 
red states, blue states alike have used tobacco taxes, uh, which has helped generate that. It's generated funding for other things, which I think is fine. Um, we've had advertising, uh, bans, smoke-free public places, all things that could be, have been successfully implemented in lower middle income countries, but have not been. Um, I think in terms of supporting this, I, I think we, we need to ramp up our support to tobacco uh, control um, in the US. Currently, uh, uh, the CDC spends, um, I think the last budget I saw was something in the area of around $3 million on its international uh, uh, tobacco uh, control. That money actually comes through the CDC Foundation and funded by Bloomberg. Um, that's great, that's not a problem either, but this could be something that could be certainly uh, increased. Uh, but other areas as well, we lack technical uh, capacity, or low and middle income countries lack technical capacity around uh, tobacco tax enforcement and collection. That's something certainly that we, we have good experience in. Uh, product regulation, we have good experience in there. Uh, one of the things we call for in the task force, uh, I'll mention too on tobacco, uh, is uh, a trust fund. Uh, at the World Bank to support low-income countries looking to start up their tobacco control programs. World Bank currently has one now on international, or I mean, sorry, on pharmaceutical regulation, uh, which has been quite successful. Uh, this is something that we recommended should be uh, done for tobacco, and that would pro provide uh, some funding to do that. It could be relatively modest. Um, but uh, the World Bank and the IHM, uh, IMF are trying to do more support of uh, low and middle income countries looking to adopt these policies. The other is our, our trade policy. I'm a, uh, formerly from uh, USTR on these issues. We had a number of people on the task force, both uh, Republicans and uh, Democrats uh, with, uh, that were former trade officials. And one recommendation that I'm, I'm happy to convey is uh, the task force was unanimous that uh, trade negotiations currently ongoing, U.S. trade negotiations currently ongoing, uh, should exclude from dispute resolution tobacco control measures uh, provided under the framework convention of tobacco control, as well as under U.S. law. And that was not something particularly controversial for this task force, and I think is something that could be done. Great, thank you, Harold. Just to respond briefly to. Uh, to what Tom just said, um, and some things Howard just said, just get a little dialogue going among us because uh, we're all lecturing from the podium here, and I'm guilty as anybody. But, but uh, the, first of all, um, with respect to tobacco control, one other element here is tobacco control research. Um, for the last few years, I've been co-hosting a gathering of cancer research funders around the world, and we've found that, that most of those funding organizations don't support any real research on tobacco control. Uh, and uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, Cancer Research UK, with the NCI's help, we're, we're the two biggest funders of cancer con uh, tobacco control research. We're trying to develop a framework for other cancer funders around the world to think more deeply about these problems and to learn how to uh, adapt um, tobacco control measures, of which there are many, as Tom pointed out, uh, that are suitable to each country. Some countries are not going to tax their citizens for tobacco use. Uh, and and the, the variety of tobacco use in different parts of the world is really remarkable. You go to Turkey, as Marie knows, or to, or to Indonesia, and you see all the kinds of, of tobacco use that require different kinds of control measures. The second thing is a caution about making simple arithmetic comparisons of what we spend on different diseases. I don't think it's healthy to talk about Ebola versus, uh, versus cancer. Uh, Ebola was an amazing threat, it can rip through a country and, and destroy the world's economy overnight. And we need, when that happens, the, country, the, the world needs to consolidate its efforts to control an infection that could be uh, devastating to the world's population. And I think, um, you know, obviously, the, the numbers, I mean, I've, I'm used to comparing numbers on we, of dollars we, can, we devote to research on HIV to many other diseases. This is a slippery slope, and uh, um, I think in many ways, um, George W. Bush deserves a lot of credit for starting PEPFAR and really coping with a disease that was devastating Africa. Populations were falling, economies were deteriorating, and this program, which was expensive, I think set a standard for how we can, we can bring uh, strong science-based health tools 
to poor countries and, and reverse a trend. I mean, before PEPFAR happened, we were, I think, 16th, something like that, in the list of countries that, uh, that, um, that were trying to provide uh, international assistance for public health. And uh, it, it changed um, attitudes in a major way. It is shameful that the numbers we, we, we now have heard about for, uh, uh, for chronic diseases um, are so low. But uh, I don't think we, in, in adjusting the balance, I think we have to recognize that, that some infectious diseases are just going to be immediate threats of uh, contagion that uh, we're going to require more resources and certain other things. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and open the floor to some comments uh, and questions. And please be very succinct. Limit yourself to one comment or question and identify yourself. What we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, bundle together uh, three or four at a time and then come back to our speakers. Lois, right here, Joe. Hi, my name is Lois Pace with the Liz Strong Foundation. Many thanks to Steve and CSIS for, uh, for this event, and thanks to each of the panelists for your remarks. Um, I want to come back to um, making the case and specifically um, the response to that case. And so this is yet another really um, powerful report and set of recommendations that builds on um, some of the other um, types of reports we've seen before, like IHME or out of World Economic Forum. And so I'm wondering, and specifically for Tom, but anyone can respond, how um, the people who matter are reacting to this. Um, there are a number of really strong recommendations that have been put forth, but what I want to know is what people on the Hill are saying, what people within the administration are saying um, they will do um, as a result, and how we can really move the needle um, so that that funding and other resources really shift in the way that we need them to. Voice just hand right here. Yes. Uh, ben Anderson, uh, Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Uh, an observation and brief question. The observation is that NCDs and cancer is different from infectious diseases in that it requires the building of capacity. You can't just get a vaccine to the country. So this requires policymakers in country to build hospital systems and capacity. How do you convince policymakers to be diverting their resources to this? area of building infrastructure in ways that they can understand, particularly when policymakers are often not physicians, are often not scientists, and have other priorities in mind. Thank you. We had over here, Joe. And Nelson, um, I could talk for two hours, but I'll keep it to a small point. I'm a pathologist. I work at the Joint Pathology Center, and I've been working a lot with uh, Dr. Trimble on a project to improve pathology. In the US, there is one pathologist per 15,000 people. In Africa, there is less than one pathologist per million people. Eight countries have none, and less than 25% of people who need a diagnostic biopsy get one. We just got through doing a two-year survey, which I'm going to present at the World Cancer Day. But I think our group of pathologists is called African strategies for advancing pathology, because it has to occur in Africa with the African pathologists and governments. But our um, single goal is no treatment without a diagnosis. Thank you. We had another hand. Michael, right here. Right here. Hi, Mark Miller from Fogarty NIH. Uh, tobacco seems to be a low-hanging fruit, but there, there is an issue about the short-term benefits of the economic vested interests versus the long-term benefits of disease prevention. And how do you get past uh, the issues of good governance and accountability in government, whereas short-term commercial interests frequently play into practice with large tobacco industries in many of these countries, putting pressure on short-term uh, ministers of health? Um, even to the point of some cynicism in the Czech Republic a number of years ago made a comment that it's more cost effective to let people smoke so they don't have to pay pensions. So um, it brings up issues, though, of governance in many of these countries where we would like to work. Thank you. Um, Tom, there was, I think Lois's question was really directed initially at you, although I think the qu broader question around how do you motivate those in the administration and the Hill to take up this agenda in a new and different way applies to all of you. But you want to lead off? Sure. Um, so as we do with all our task force reports, we're, we're doing a set of briefings. Um, uh, we 
we'll brief uh, executive branch agencies, congressional uh, uh, staff, as well as members, um, foreign diplomatic corps. I think in terms of the reaction that I get uh, so far, and um, the report just came out in December, so this is an ongoing process, uh, is people are surprised. Um, I, 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 particularly when you look at the case studies of what this looks like in the same countries. I think most people view this, again, as a unfortunate byproduct of success happening really in only wealthier countries and something that might happen in lower middle income countries uh, down the line. And I think people are really surprised by the data. So we've, we've gotten a favorable reaction so far. I think it's going to be a process uh, in terms of uh, making, reframing this issue as one, again, about inequity. That's really not very different from the case that exists on a whole variety of global health issues. I, I agree on the direct threats from infectious diseases, but that is by and large not where our money goes. Um, we, we, the money the U.S. devotes to emerging infectious diseases is relatively low. Um, the vast majority of what we invest are to more chronic, uh, chronic infectious disease problems. Um, infrastructure, the only thing I would say here is we, in many countries, operate the largest chronic care uh, 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 platform through the PEPFAR program in um, the countries that that operates. That, I don't want to oversell the possibility of integration because I think there are real challenges, but there have been successful pilots in some areas, particularly cervical cancer is a good one, um, where you might be able to leverage that infrastructure in a cost-effective manner, and I think there's uh, some real possibility. On the economic uh, uh, vested uh, interests, I, I, I think it's a challenge for countries that have a state-owned um, tobacco monopoly. That's not true for a lot of countries, but it's true for some. Um, and uh, making it more apparent what the cost is. I think also uh, as more countries, and I'm a little more hopeful on the progress that has occurred on international tobacco control um, in recent years, particularly with the funding that has come in through, through um, Bloomberg uh, Philanthropy, which I should also note funded this task force, as well as the Gates <laughs> Foundation, um, uh, uh, which has funded uh, tobacco control in Africa. I think there has been a bit more progress than we've seen previously. Carol. Just one or two comments. Um, first, um, with respect to PEPFAR, I really agree strongly that the PEPFAR facilities that have been created could be stepping stones to, uh, as to uh, using those platforms for, for other kinds of things. What some people don't know is the PEPFAR program has been cut dramatically uh, at financial level, and, and uh, the current ambassador running the program, uh, Deborah Ricks, is uh, struggling with a, a $1 billion, 20% cut in her budget, which makes these efforts to extend the influence of PEPFAR facilities uh, in, a, in a dramatic way. I'd say in response, not to the specific report, but to the general interest in, in cancer in developing countries, that, that I'm seeing a surprising degree of response in a community, a scientific community, that's afflicted by flat, actually declining budgets in, 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 in constant dollars. Our cancer centers are enthusiastic about getting engaged. The students we hear from are very enthusiastic. The many societies, uh, not just the ACS, which has had a long-standing interest here, but but surgical societies, other medical societies, have uh, re recognized that uh, this, in some ways, is the greatest global threat uh, in, in the, the incidence and mortality of cancer in poor countries, and that they've got to get adapted to the idea that what we're producing to benefit Americans has got to be shared with the other parts of the world. Okay. Um, well, just briefly, I mean, to, to Ben's comment about, um, you know, the necessity to build the infrastructure, I mean, I really think that's true, and I think it needs to really be the health system that gets built at the end of the day. It's not that I think we shouldn't confront threats like Ebola, which come up suddenly and have to be dealt with. That's true, but when I see now all these hospitals that were supposedly built for Ebola, but Ebola is diminishing or has moved on, I think we should be building health systems and not necessarily purpose-built health facilities. And, and that's uh, where I think we should be um, investing. I also think it's really important that uh, we be looking to the UN and the UN institutions and the post 
Millennium Development Goals. They were set in place in 2000, and they talk about specifically cutting the rate of HIV AIDS in half and talking about maternal and child health. Of course, there's no mention whatsoever of non so Of course, that's about to be, the whole diseases. process is being reactivated now. The whole so. process is being reactivated wow. because the Millennium Development Goals yeah. expire this year, and there is a whole process going on to say, well, what replaces them? And I think it's, uh, there are a lot of things working in New York and in Geneva and other places, and I think it's important that there be some goals. There have been some goals set um, for what we want to do about non-communicable diseases. And goals that are more specific than what was said in a couple of years ago yeah. when the UN had its first meeting well, on non-communicable diseases. Which was an important milestone in 2011. Right. Right. And in 2014, they did kind of a review. And actually, quite a lot had happened. I mean, there were a lot of cancer registries were being established, and there were NCD plans in place in a number of countries. But of course, now the important thing is to do them, right. to, to, to really get it done. So I think we need to be investing some attention in this too. That's part of putting it on the world's agenda and keeping it on mm -hmm. the world's agenda. Just one comment in terms of trade and tobacco. Um, I, I think it's really important that the task force bipartisan group sort of was unanimous on the fact that um, car tobacco should be a carve out in, in trade agreements. Um, we also did some polling of our grassroots um, mm -hmm. uh, connections in the, in the United States, and we asked um, people through a, a survey, and these were Republicans and Democrats, red states and blue states, is it important that public health be a part of trade agreements? And if you recall, the first trade agreement that ever had anything besides trade in it was NAFTA, and that talked about environmental standards and trade standard, trade labor standards. Now our grassroots group is saying public health is more important than either one of those things. So I think there there is um, you know there is hope, and I think through these trade agreements, the president getting fast track authority, and then the the Pacific Treaty that he's uh, their plan to negotiate and the one with the European Union. Um, it's really an important time to send um, both a signal and to make a difference in the ability of tobacco companies, which they are, are doing, by the way, of, of absolutely going after um, countries large and small from Australia to Uganda and threatening to bring them to court over issues such as plain packaging, which those countries are trying to do in order to promote a decrease in, particularly in young people, taking up smoking. So I think that's a, a very important issue. Um, uh, the one thing I wanted just to say on um, uh, tobacco and trade in this report, the reason why we were able to come up with a unanimous consensus, I'm uh, you know, a former trade negotiator, very pro-trade, so many of the people on the task force were. Uh, what's unusual about tobacco is there's a binding international convention uh, requiring these policies. Every TPP member other than the U.S. Is, has ratified and has ceded to that treaty. Uh, there's also an executive order issued by President Clinton that the U.S. will not promote tobacco use internationally. Uh, that executive order remains in effect. It is the only consumer product that, uh, when used as directed, kills you. There is no healthy use of tobacco. And it was very easy for the task force on those grounds, given its burden, given its legal status, uh, to say that tobacco is different and uh, deserves to be treated as such in their trade negotiations. Could I just make one comment about the, the comment about pathology? Um, I don't know if I omitted it in my opening remarks, but I meant to say something about the importance of pathology to be sure that when we try to figure out what the problem is in each country, we know what the diagnoses really are. And I totally agree with the, the scant attention that's been given to the importance of pathology, especially in, in developing countries. Uh, and it is critical to the whole nature of combating cancer. But I would like to take the, the discussion one step further and point out that that there are new technologies that can help make pathology more readily available, and that those technologies are actually of broader use in, in global health, and that is using mobile technology and electronic communication to, for example, to try to solve, if you, if you can section a, a, a tumor or a mass in, 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 a, in a poor country, and you, can't, you don't have somebody on hand to make the diagnosis, you can uh, use uh, uh, telemedicine to 
have somebody who's sitting at Dana-Farber or, or Sloan Kettering to help with the diagnosis. I think that notion of using um, mobile communication to improve health outcomes, especially in chronic disease, is extremely important. To go back to uh, the Burkitt's lymphoma problem in, in Uganda, uh, the, the cure rates in Uganda still remain very low, no, under 50%, whereas in the US, the same disease is almost always cured. And one of the reasons we lose a lot of patients is they go back to their village and don't use the electronic the, um, phones that they have to, uh, to, to alert their physicians that uh, they need further therapy. I know that the Hutch has been very involved in trying to bring, uh, the Hutch is now um, in basically the major partner with the Uganda Cancer Institute, and they're working hard to make these communications devices uh, a better tool in, in, throughout uh, uh, Uganda. Please use the microphone there, Anne. Yeah, sorry. The WHO big cancer report that just come out, came out does not really discuss pathology. That's true, right, John? Yeah. Well, uh, that's not my problem. I mean, it's, it's my problem, but it's not my responsibility. <laughs> yeah, we're discussing it, as you know from talking to Drew Drimble. Yeah. Let's, let's take another round of, of questions. Uh, Keith, Martin, and then uh, up front here on this side, and then we'll, we'll get two. Uh, folks on that side. Keith. Thank you, Steve, and uh, congratulations, Tom and Ambassador Kyle. Good to see you and Dr. Varmus. We don't have, we know we don't have a, a knowledge problem. We have an implementation problem. And the interesting thing is the structures we're talking about, whether it's the public health, primary care, or access to surgery, these, the failure to invest in these are political decisions. But there's also a confluence between the ID and the NCDs coming together because that structure is needed to do, deal with both of them. My question is to all of you, um, in your experience, what are some of the political opportunities we have to work with countries and LMICs, to, to work with them to invest in the public health, primary care, and surgical access they need to combat both NCDs and IDs? Thank you. Thank you. Just in front of you there, Keith. Uh, thank you. Lisa Stevens from the NCI Center for Global Health. So I want to bring some of the comments together about the um, amount of money that the U.S. spends on global health, the comments about PEPFAR, the reduced budget for PEPFAR, how it does provide an infrastructure that we could utilize, mention the pink ribbon, red ribbon initiative, and just say that I think in this instance we may be our own worst enemies in that across the U.S. government we would like to collaborate and like to build on that infrastructure, but with the reduced budget, you know, who directs the focus of what those uh, facilities are going to be used for is problematic and bring it into the discussion about this UN fund, this global fund for NCDs. Because absent some additional funding, I'm Yes, over here. Um, yes, please. Good morning. My name is Tatiana Soldak. I represent the organization Resource and Policy Exchange. I have a question about collaboration between NCI and USAID because I see this as a, a problem on the field. Like, for example, um, USAID issues request for proposal or request for application and supports our HIV programs in many countries. However, if you will include uh, and integrate uh, cancer program, like for example, cervical cancer, they will never consider this seriously. So I think that it's a uh, misinformation that cancer even can be included uh, into uh, you know comprehensive HIV package. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, right behind. Thank you. I'm Barney Morugan at Development Finance International. We're a consulting firm that bridges business and development. So my question is actually about access to treatment. So uh, I think it's very promising that we're now seeing a lot of low and middle income countries have national cancer plans, but by and large, they really focus on prevention and screening. And a lot of the discussion here is focused on tobacco control. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how to expand access to treatment that's affordable and effective, um, including perhaps mentioning some of the new breakthrough therapies um, around immunotherapy for cancer, which, as we know, is, is extremely expensive even in this country. Thank you. So we have a question around what political opportunities exist to invest, 
a question about how do you cope with reduced budgets, a question around the NCI, USAID collaborations, and then the issue about how to expand real access. Well, I might say a couple of things in response to these heterogeneous questions. Um, just with respect to USAID, um, there has been a fair amount of exchange. I've been down to USAID to lecture on this topic. Uh, Ambassador Shaw has been to the NIH. Um, they have their very high-level priorities. Um, we are more than prepared to try to coordinate our work with them. When I go to poor countries, uh, people I meet on the ground are always, almost always from USAID or from CDC, and there's a, a good constructive relationship. Uh, with respect to what they just choose to fund, they have their own Grand Challenges program, and uh, I think Ambassador Shaw would say that uh, they be willing to work with us, their resources are limited, they've, made, they've chose to, chosen to focus on, on certain things, and uh, that's where it stands. So I don't think it's an acrimonious relationship, but I agree that there is the potential for greater synergy than currently exists. Um, well, let me just say again, to the heterogeneous questions, pick out a few points that, that may have some commonality. And I think one of them is that we need to get better figures around um, cost of things. What does it actually cost? We say, oh, these are, are low cost, these are able to be done. Um, we asked ourselves, we're working in a coalition with others called the Cervical Cancer Action Group. And so we convened this we, in one of the meetings, decided that an important thing to do would be to figure out what it would cost. We say it's a perfectly preventable disease. What would it cost? So we went to the Harvard School of Public Health, and we have a report that will be coming out within the next couple of weeks about what would the cost be for um, vaccinating um, every 10-year-old girl in the world, and we're not yet talking about boys in the world in general, but if we vaccinate eventually. <laughs> eventually. But if we vaccinate, we have after all, we have a vaccine, you know, and it varies of course in cost. Very importantly, Gabby last week had its replenishment exercise in Berlin, fully funded at seven point five billion dollars, a billion dollars of that coming from the United States. Gabby a couple of years ago decided that HPV should be included. That's only for the very poorest countries, only for the GAVI eligible countries. Nonetheless, at full funding um, for GAVI, GAVI will step up and be offering vaccine um, in more countries through um, demonstration projects and eventually national projects. But our question was, what would it cost if you vaccinated every 10-year-old girl and if you screened every woman um, at least twice in her lifetime between the ages of 30 and 49. What's the global cost? Because I think we began to get lots of money allocated for HIV when we could put some cost figures on it. Um, so as I say, the, the top line seems to be, and of course it varies tremendously whether you're screening with pap smears or you're screening with VIA, which is a low cost, uh, somewhat variable results, but certainly can be effective in, certain, in many settings. Um, what does it cost to have the Gavi price for vaccine versus um, the PAHO price, which is a negotiated price, versus another price? Is it two doses or three doses? So lots of variables. But the cost is about $3 billion a year over 10 years. Now, that's not beyond us. So I think as we get to looking at some of these issues, how do we have access to life-saving measures, we need to know the cost and we're beginning to get that cost. Let me just build on your comment to address one question that was raised back here that seemed to imply that, we, that the issue now is implementation, not knowing more things. And I think that's not a fair assessment, that there are a lot of more things we need to know. Some of them just have to do with how, uh, how best to do implementation. I think implementation science, which can be a somewhat fuzzy area, uh, is actually got its, its, its merits, and we need to be doing more to uh, ensure that we know how to take what we do know and, and make it more accessible. But I think the, your discussion of HPV vaccine is a good case in point. Uh, there is evidence that even one dose of the vaccine rather right. than two or three may be useful, and we're now organizing a trial to mm -hmm. test that idea. Moreover, 
uh, there, it isn't as though there's one HPV vaccine. The vaccine itself is, is evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, Merck is about to yeah. like to get approval for its, nano, its, its nine strain yeah, vaccine. And yeah. what will happen to the price of the two and four right. strain vaccines right. after that is very mm -hmm. much open to yeah. question. So there are mm -hmm. opportunities here to make the vaccine a lot cheaper, not just because patents expire, which they eventually will, but because right. I, now, will it be fair to give to um, a woman in a poor country, a vaccine which has become somewhat obsolete in the, in the US because a more sophisticated vaccine has been produced here, that's an open question. But it seems to me that, that a vaccine that protects against 70% of cervical cancer is better right. than nothing. And Merck has just licensed it to Brazil, by the way. So Brazil will be producing the its own. The non-avalent, yeah. No, the, no, the, four, four, the four, quadra four, 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 But they will be producing their own. Uh -huh. So I think these are beginning to happen. Let me just say one thing about treatment. I mean. Certainly, we've all been talking about prevention, and certainly prevention is terribly well, important. Well, we've talked a little bit about treatment. We and we, we, will, we will not treat our way out of this epidemic, right, right. but I think we cannot ignore treatment. And again, I think looking at the pragmatic things we've been um, working on um, are building out sort of what we've learned about how we get pain relief drugs out to learn more and taking also advantage of what has been done in HIV to get um, HIV drugs out, what are the barriers in the supply chains, what's already there, what could be there, what could be there sooner rather than later, and what could be there at an affordable cost. So I think if, you know, there is no treatment, AIDS is now um, less stigmatized in Africa than cancer because there are drugs for AIDS and there are virtually no drugs for cancer. So it's very important, I think, to have treatment options, and that should certainly also include radiotherapy and surgery. Um, and I say it won't happen everywhere, and they won't always be the most sophisticated, but I think to begin to push these barriers back is the way to promote more screening and earlier detection, and therefore treatments that can actually work. Great. Uh, I'll just throw in a couple of things on uh, the budget question tied to PEPFAR uh, and uh, what, whether we are um, uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. I think the problem with that platform as we move forward is if it continues to be uh, disease focused, HIV focused, as the, epi the burden in these countries shift, uh, you're going to see more cutting and fund cut of funding. One of the things we did out of this task force uh, report is a group of us, um, uh, myself, uh, Zeke Emanuel, Donna Shalala, Tommy Thompson, David Satcher, and Eric Goosby did a piece in The Lancet calling for a shift in the approach to US global health towards an outcome-based approach. Uh, to be more uh, demand-driven than supply-driven, not just the diseases and interventions we want to put out there, uh, but responding to what the actual health needs are in the countries that we want to invest in. And I think shifting the way we think about global health in that manner would be helpful in terms of maintaining US commitment on these issues. If they are tied to a very precious set of um, infectious diseases, then and as the burden shifts, it'll be, it'll be hard to sustain. So I think that's important. Um, in terms of health systems, I, everyone will say, and I certainly agree, that uh, health systems need to build, be built in these countries, particularly when you, and it's in the report, I won't get into the numbers, but the disparities of health spending in low and middle income countries versus wealthy countries is spectacular. To just throw one statistic out there, all of the governments of Sub-Saharan Africa spend as much as the government of Poland on health. And that gives you a sense of what differences we are talking about in terms of health system. It's not just pathology. Those kinds of numbers exist on virtually everything. Uh, I, I continue to believe, though, that um, in terms of from a donor perspective or international intervention, it, need, it does need to be diagonal. You need to tie it to a intervention people can understand. And uh, I, I think that is the way to build, build cell, uh, health systems. On the issue of treatment access, uh, I, I think it's, it's important uh, that we uh, extend access to these treatments. But I do worry sometimes that our treatment access debates end up on a very small set of interventions that are patented as opposed to a recognition of how much is lacking in these countries in terms of accessibility of treatments. And the entire debate is eaten up about patents and access to medicines, which doesn't mean it's not an issue. It's, but we have, we have to talk about the broader health needs in these countries. And I, I fear we don't spend enough time 
talking about all the other off-patent treatment, which is enormous, the uh, available tools that aren't getting to these countries either. Before we run out of time, I want to ask our, our speakers to address the issues, the controversies around vaccine use. I mean, this week we've had the, uh, the controversy around measles, um, Senator Rand Paul, Governor Christie. So in this same week, we have uh, field trials beginning, historic field trials beginning in Liberia uh, on the Ebola vaccine, uh, backed by NIH, GSK, and others, and uh, with two vaccines and a third to begin in, in Sierra Leone, also historic, soon. So we're in a, a particularly uh, uh, important moment um, as a country uh, in, in, in with respect to this, and these controversies are very live. Harold, what, what can you tell us about the <laughs> trust and <Why> confidence, <laughs> the trust and confidence that we need to have moving ahead? We're talking about a hepatitis B, we're talking about yeah. HPV. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important in having these discussions to consider what the vaccines are intended to do and what kinds of diseases are being confronted, because Obviously, uh, having a vaccine in hand to confront an immediate threat to the world's health like Ebola or an, another emerging infection is very different from dealing with, uh, with a, a disease that's been around a long time like measles, which, where the hole that we've created in, in, uh, by, by um, allowing people to, uh, to neglect vaccinating kids who were then going to be part of the commons when they go to, when they go to school and, and, uh, and we're creating the kind of Disneyland um, uh, event that we, we just come through is very, very different. And uh, you know, there, there are two issues on the table, most obviously. One is informing and persuading people that vaccination is a worthwhile thing. And mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned when I see um, relatively little dissemination of reports uh, like the one just produced by the President's Cancer Panel uh, for the NCI and the President on, on vaccination, then the use of pap papillomavirus vaccine, mm -hmm. which uh, where the uptake in this country is deplorably low, uh, lower even than in Gavi countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. striking to me how a country like Rwanda, which does qualify for, for Gavi, has vaccinated over 80% of its, of its girls and uh, uh, in Mexico, they now have a government-endorsed program that provides vaccination for all fifth-grade girls. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just think that the, the role of civil society in, in, in developing policies that make sense for the whole population uh, need to be stronger. Um, I'm not sure that I can uh, add very much on, the, on to that uh, debate. It, um, you know, it's just, again, going back to the days of working more intensively on HIV, you know, we, that was the holy grail. If only we had a vaccine, if we just had a vaccine. And here we have had an HBV vaccine for some time, an HPV for six or seven years, two of them, in fact, more coming on the market. Our own rate in the United States is only about 32% um, vaccinated. And of course, in many countries, it's not on the radar screen at all. So um, I think we, we need to um, keep beating that drum that um, when we have vaccines, they are clearly life-saving and they should be employed and they can be employed. Um, the Copenhagen consensus has just come out with a report showing that HPV vaccine is as cost-effective as other interventions for young women and girls and even at, even at its full price. So uh, clearly we should. Well, there are many lessons to be learned from the HIV situation, because we've wanted a vaccine from the start, we've never gotten one, right. and yet we, we, we have brought the disease under some right. control, but mm -hmm. we're just not gonna get rid of this disease right. unless we have vaccination. And the experience with uh, other vaccines does make one worry that even if we had a vaccine, would it actually get used in, at the levels that are required to mm -hmm. To put, to put an end to this, to this uh, international infection. The one thing I'll, thing I'll say quickly on this is I, I thought it was great. I was heartened by the speed with which the clarifications were issued uh, by the two likely uh, candidates who ha had made comments yesterday. And uh, because I do think the worst thing that could happen if, if the vaccine debate was not, um, uh, uh, it didn't already lack a scientific basis. If this were to be politicized and seen as a big government uh, issue, that would be a, a real shame. So I was glad to see the fast uh, clarification. 
um, from uh, both of those candidates. On the Ebola side, the one thing I will mention, because I think there has been, there is uh, a lot of uh, reports in the press that it was a scandal uh, that a Ebola vaccine or the drugs hadn't been moved forward before. And I think one of the things that um, becomes clear from what's happening now is it's very, well, two things. One, we are talking about a disease that in 40 years prior to this outbreak had killed fewer than 2,000 people. Um, second, it's really hard to develop these things in the, ab uh, in the absence of an outbreak. And uh, I did not find it particularly scandalous that didn't move forward. It would have been great if there was more investment in these areas, but I, I think what you're seeing now is um, uh, hopefully um, uh, calms down some of the rhetoric around Let that. me just uh, ask you to support that statement with a couple of facts that most people don't know, which is that uh, NIH-supported investigators have been working on an Ebola vaccine since the late 90s. And indeed, the Vaccine Research Center at NIH had a candidate vaccine. And for the reasons Tom's bringing up, uh, you know, A, there had been very few deaths. Almost all the disease had been confined to certain local villages. Um, and moreover, uh, while we're all talking about Ebola, how about Marburg? How about Lassa fever? I mean, there, it's not the only uh, lethal virus out there that could cause pandemonium. So making a decision uh, to ramp up, get, and you know, then these viruses need to be, the vaccines would need to be tested. Very hard to test the vaccine in a clinical population if there's not an outbreak. And indeed, one of the things we're all watching carefully is whether the, the very welcome decline in, in Ebola in, in West Africa at the moment is going to allow the, the current uh, right. vaccination trials to reach their desired endpoint. Right. We've gotten to the end of our time here now. Um, uh, this has been extraordinarily rich and uh, interesting. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, our three speakers. Special thanks to Travis Hopkins for uh, pulling this together. Thank you, Travis. Uh, 